Star Baby, welcome back to 10% True. Good to see you again. Thanks. It's great to be back. It's, it's like you were never away. I, it was. I was never away. I mean, how can the audience tell, right? So speaking of the audience, so so that they have some idea of what we're doing today, uh, you and I a couple of weeks ago recorded, uh, we called it, I think, or I called it Wild Weasel 4, but it was really about the Strike Eagle's contribution to killing Sam's um, using kinetic um, methods in the uh, 1999 Operation Allied Force, March 1999 Allied Force. But of course, leading up to that have been four or five years of Strike Eagles operating in the Balkans um, under a number of different guises, uh, a number of different operational names. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So if anybody's sort of thinking, well, how does this tie into what we talked about for Wild Blues of Four? There you go. This will provide some context and some background. And it's about much more um, than just the Strike Eagle killing SAM sites, which was what we talked about before. Now, before we go into that, um, for the audience at home, just a reminder, this content's free. If you like it, subscribe, hit the uh, subscription and the bell button to get notified of future episodes. And for free to share it, that's a really important thing. If uh, you think this is good content, you think what Star Baby is sharing with us uh, is worth other people seeing, then share it with them actively and, and bring them along to the channel. And of course, come along to the Discord uh, server because there's a lot of conversation that goes on there with Star Baby and other SMEs as well. We've got a, another Strike Eagle Wizzo. Uh, sorry, yeah, we've got an F4, EA6, EWO, Strike Eagle Wizard, we've got an EF-111 pilot, we've got a Strike Eagle pilot, uh, we've got a Hornet guy who pops by occasionally, doesn't say too much, but there's a bunch of SMEs there and you can come and interact with all of them uh, and ask questions and, and have them maybe answered or, or maybe not, you never know, if you don't ask, you won't find out. With that said, Star Baby, um, tell us then a little bit about what happened when you got to Lake Anith, because I think that's really where this story starts. You told us on a previous episode about getting to see more uh, you know, what it was like getting into the Strike Eagle um, in those earlier days. What happened when you got to Lake and Heath then? So I arrived at Lake and Heath in around July of 1997. And, you know, this is kind of exciting. I, I, I'm I, not mission ready, of course. If I'd passed my check ride in the, the formal training unit or I wouldn't have been able to graduate. I head off to Lake and Heath and go to Royal Air Force, Lake and Heath and... I check in at the squadron and I show up at the ops desk and there's a note. There's a note waiting for me at the ops desk. And it is from my great aunt, Dora Norrington, who is about to turn 90, informing me where and when her 90th birthday party is going to be. And she had been calling the ops desk at the squadron every week to track my arrival and make sure I knew when the birthday party was. So when I checked into the, the squadron at Lake and Heath, it was like, hey, you know, welcome you know, we'll 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 have an air crew meeting. Then you can get your act together. Oh, and by the way, you're going to your aunt Dora's 90th birthday party, or we'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> so that was all prearranged, and that's my arrival at Lake and Heath. And I was assigned to the Red Squadron, the 494th Fighter Squadron, uh, Panthers. And this is the good old days when we're all in a hardened shelter, just like I'd been in the Spangdalem and Phantom. So it's a familiar NATO environment, and I start really learning to get good at the strike eagle so i go through a, a mission check and it's relatively uneventful although often my mission checks are complete disasters uh that i just managed to somehow skate out of as it turns out this one was not a complete disaster um and because i don't remember anything about it so it must have been okay and now i'm a mission ready wizzo with a bunch of G model weasel time and, you know, incrementing strike eagle time. But one of the things that's different about Royal Air Force Lake and Heath among the strike eagle units is that RAF Lake and Heath is a nuclear or was correctly at the time, a nuclear strike wing and all the dark rays and all the dark gray crews had to be qualified in nuclear strike to support the NATO mission. So in the Navy, by the way, the Navy talks of strike, which is just dropping bombs on something. When Air Force says strike, we specifically mean employment of nuclear weapons. And strike is a no fail 100 percent all the time kind of operation. And it's a huge pain in the neck and it consumes sorties that could be better used for things that you actually expect to do. But it is an aspect of NATO's deterrence model. So as part of this, after you get mission ready, you have to normally go through a what's called a certification, a nuclear strike certification. 
And again, you have to study up for this. You have to learn this. You know, it's my first time going to this kind of mission. Although the 111 guys, if you were a 111 retread from Lake and Heath, you'd have understood all of this. I didn't. So you got to study. You got to study the training, the comm, the authentication. And then you go in front of a board, which consists of every squadron commander, flying squadron commander on the base, and usually the group of the wing commander. And you and your pilot stand up there and you brief your training mission and you answer all the questions and you do your thing. And you don't want to bust it. I mean, really, the the holy grail uh, for Strike is to actually find a way to get yourself excluded from ever doing nuclear ever again without actually negatively affecting your security clearance or your promotion potential. And nobody has ever figured that out. So it's like it's it's Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. That and that doesn't even account for all the brain cells that are still there because no zero percent failure, hundred percent right. Some of that stuff is still occupying portions of my brain. So we get there, and where people get into trouble on a verification or certification is they freelance or they answer something that was not asked, but they go off the beaten path. And I remember being told a story of one bust where. After the whole training line brief, one of the board members asks a Strike Eagle pilot, says, OK, you're you're intercepted. You're going up the Baltic. You're intercepted by a neutral fighter. Let's just say it's Sweden. How do you handle it? Well, there's procedures, you know, for handling an intercept. And, you know, they're going to tell you to divert. What are you going to do then? And his answer was, I'm going to tell them to get off my back or I'm going to drop the weapon on their country. <laughs> Bang. Instant bust. History. I mean, why would you say something stupid like that? But that was part of the Lake and Heath lore. And so I I got the brief, and the brief is, ask the question, and only the question that is asked. So we go through the certification. Uh, Captain Hubbard was my pilot. Um, and he... Uh, he and I do our thing. We brief. We get to the question and answer period. You know, we're still kind of working through all the mission stuff. And one of the things you have to do is you have to decode an emergency action message. And the decoding procedures at the time were a nightmare. Do this, do that. We had little tabs called cookies. You have to break the cookie. You have to decode the cookie. That's, I did not retain those brain cells. The only reason I even remember cookie is because it associates with one of my favorite food. <laughs> and, or biscuits. That's biscuits for you guys. Uh, anyway, I mean, there's no blue guy on Sesame Street called the Biscuit Monster, so you should kind of have gotten the clue. Uh, anyway, so the the squadron commander from the Ops Support Squadron looks at me and says, all right, Captain Petruca, can you decode this message? And I look at him and I say, yes. And I don't say anything else. And the clock's ticking. And he's waiting and the clock because you've only got one hour. It only lasts for one hour and I'm burning time right now. And I and finally he realizes that I had asked the question. i had answered the question he had asked and only the question that he had asked. The light comes on behind his eyes and he goes, well, will you? It's like, sure. And so I decode the message. We do our thing. We get to the question answer session at the end and one last wild card waiting for me. And one of the other squadron commanders said, your squadron commander, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Wood, has been bragging about your electronic warfare prowess. And so I've got an electronic warfare question for you. And immediately my pilot takes three steps to the right and disappears, you know, off to the side of the briefing room, making it clear that he's got no part of this whole thing. Uh, and I'm standing there. OK, what's your question? And the questioner says, OK, so when you're talking about defining the edges of an antenna beam, um, you define the edges of the beam by what's called the half power point. He says, what's the signal strength of the half power point? I look at him, I say minus three dB. Now, most of the audience isn't going to recognize what I've said because it's not an electronic warfare question. It's an electric engineering, electrical engineering program. And I flunked out of engineering by the end of my third semester. But nevertheless, the guy felt that he'd asked me an electronic warfare question. I knew the thing. Certification is over. And what I learned, one of the members of the board that I didn't mention is the wing EWO. Or if the wing EWO is not available, you grabbed any EWO. So you could fill your annual certification square 
by sitting on six boards where you made other people miserable. You logged it six times and that counted for you. So I'm an EWO, limited number of EWOs, and later the wing EWO, I never sat another certification for myself again. That was the only one I ever had to do. I've got my little nuclear qualification ribbon, which I've never worn. Um, And there we go. A couple of years of uh, wasting sorties doing you know nuclear delivery uh, maneuvers and this and that in England uh, on the training range or wherever else we happen to do it. Uh, absolutely just to log the sorties. So, but you know, could have done it and didn't want to nuclear missions suck. What, what did, uh, what did the ribbon look like? I didn't even know there was a ribbon for it. Um, I have no idea. I've never worn it. <laughs> it's on my records. It was late. I mean, it didn't come around till the two thousands and, you know, then you had to apply for it. You had to send a bunch of data in and then they delayed the rollout. So I kind of forgot about it. You know, the, the Air Force was going through their little Schwantz dance on the ribbons. And there are a couple there that I'm missing that eventually I will get the Board of Military Records to correct so that when I die and they they entomb my ashes in a little Maxwell House jar with my ribbon rack, um, I'll at least have the correct ribbons. Was this around the same time? I can't remember what it was called. It was um, it was Combat Pretty or something like that. It was a program to make air bases pretty. Uh, certainly Lake and Heath and Spang, um, Aviano probably were, I don't know if it was a USAFE thing, but they were going around painting curbs, planting flowers and stuff like that. I'm pretty sure that was happening around this time, around the early... No, it would have been later. You're talking about 1997, right? Yeah, this is maybe the mid, sort of early 2000s. Okay, I'm I'm glad because we had, you know, total quality management was our TQM. thing of the moment. You know, TQM, you've got a customer, you know, you got to deliver for the customer. It was horrible. We actually, in the F4G, uh, we talked about range quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had range quality one, two, or three, which was the, the what the APR 47, how tightly it derived the position. And they had specific definitions. And, um, you could use harms the different ways depending on the range quality that your system was giving you. And it was pretty good. But we actually, there was a rule in the weasel squadron that you could not use the Q word unless it was immediately preceded by range <laughs> or you were, you were going to pay money to drop dollars in the coffee can in the bar. Yeah. Another stupid idea, but no, I don't remember combat pretty. I'm sure that that was many a do for book write up. Yeah, I'm sure it was probably mid 2000s, like 2003, three, four, something like that. So, um, anyway, so so going back to that nuclear mission, just, just let me ask you one question about it because it's not something that I guess you could say a whole lot about anyway. But um, what what did you sort of feel about that then? Did you feel that that it was a mission you were ever actually going to fly? Did you treat it as such, trying to get 100 percent of it right to pass it? Um, did that make you treat it with some sincerity or did you look at it and were you fairly dismissive about it both so if you're going to train the mission if you're going to execute the mission you've got to get 100 percent right 100 percent of the time no slack that's the way it is um that's when i see you know things like a an incident where b-52 guys accidentally loaded nuclear warheads on a b-52 and flew it to another base that was insane mm-hmm. i mean that's where you lose the bubble um and we understood that it was an important element of NATO deterrence. And, you know, thank God we didn't have to sit the old alert in order to do that, like guys in the Cold War did. Um, But it wasn't one of the missions we expected a Strike Eagle to execute, even if nuclear weapons were going to be employed, because why would you pick a Strike Eagle when you could do the job with a missile? Uh, was kind of the view or something else with some better standoff. I mean, driving into point blank range and dropping a parachute retarded weapon on somebody's cranium and then trying to get out of there before sunrise, that would seem to be the least optimum of your options and one we weren't particularly fond of. Uh, and we asked, I mean, it's a big question. It's like, how how resistant is the F-15E to this kind of thing? And the answer is, well, you don't have a need to know. Okay, that's my reply to that answer. Uh, but I still don't, you know, didn't have a need to know. Have no idea. It's, I mean, it's realistically, it's a fairly well hardened aircraft, and probably even better now uh, once it got some fiber uh, capabilities. But 
it was it was one of those missions where you trained for a one way mission and, you know, hoped and expected you'd never have to execute it. So in the missions that you were going to fly, you did the minimum. You have a guy, you know, there's some guy is is in charge of the strike shop in the weapons shop. You know, and so it, it was a serious capability, hmm. but uh, it was not a fun one. Did you get a lot of that kind of thing? You don't have a need to know. Just generally in your in your career, not necessarily just around the strike side of things. But was that prevalent? I wouldn't say it was prevalent. It was actually pretty rare. Uh the the this the other place where you didn't have a need to know reared its ugly head was an allied force, which I'll talk about later, and all the protections layered around the stealth guys hmm. that actually caused additional confusion and mayhem in the air operation. Uh, and the fact that, you know, I still haven't forgiving, forgiven a bunch of stealth guys for BSing me uh, before the war kicked off. All right. Tell us then, how did you get to that point? Where, where did you, so you've you've arrived at Lake Anith, you've done your your strike certification, passed it. What's the, what's the first sort of indication you've got that you're going to go into an active conflict zone then? Ah, uh, well, so... We didn't have any first indications. So this is a great uh, way to go and talk about deliberate force. So deliberate force, which happened before I arrived, was the first strike eagle in the Balkans event. And that was a 10-ish, two-week uh, campaign that was designed to bring the Serbs into the peace table at Dayton, as it turned out, to end all the fighting that was going on around Bosnia and all the disaster that was Sarajevo, and all the initial series of conflicts that had broken up, broken out as the F Yugoslavia began to split up after Tito's death. And so I came into a squadron that before I arrived had done operations in the Balkans, and it was like a simmering pot for my entire time there, where... You know, in 1998, I was working time-sensitive targeting stuff. We were using the rapid targeting system, which I mentioned in the uh, F-15E weasel episode. We were practicing passing that data back and forth. We were in a major NATO exercise, and I'm halfway through it. I'm at the Air Operations Center in Kalkar, Germany, having a great time, even though I wasn't flying. And in the middle of it, I get called home to execute Nimble Lion. What the heck is Nimble Lion? Well, Nimble Lion was the always evolving plan for the Balkans, and we did not execute it in 1998. But this kind of spin up, spin down was routine for that whole time period. We could be doing anything. We had a constant commitment uh, where there were always our strike eagles at. Uh, there were always strike eagles in the Middle East, but there were a lot of NATO strike eagles when they went to Insulik, which was a bonus deal for us, because if you're going to do a no fly zone, you want to go to Insulik and not Saudi Arabia. Um, because Saudi Arabia is a whole and Insulik is great. You know, you can get shopping, guys can drink, you can walk outside the base and get great Turkish meal for peanuts. Um, you can get suits tailored. I mean, I got a couple of suits made for low amounts of money that my wife forced me to eventually throw out because they made me look like a Bulgarian secret service agent. But I, I thought they were fine. Uh, yeah, fashion, not my thing. Uh, and so Turkey was great. And those are the kind of things we were doing. And there was always this disruption. It, you know, do you plan an exercise to go to Tunisia, which took years to execute? You know, now Strike Eagle guys from Lake and Heath can go do an exercise on Crete with the Greeks. That was never an option. We were always being yanked back and forth. I got to do an exchange with the Finns, which was cool. Uh, 1998 time frame. But so let me roll the clock back and run a video. And I'll do a video that I basically combined out of stuff that was lying around when I showed up at Lake and Heath. Okay. So I had already been doing videos and I did a video at least once a year, usually for a conference at Nellis where I'd put together a wild weasel video. We'd have test videos. But when I came into the vault, there was a bunch of unclassified video of guys who had been flying at Italy during deliberate force and had taken some, I mean, this is video camera. This is tape. This is when eight millimeters were cool. Um, and then we had some weapons test video from AGM 130s. And I rolled that in and we had some red flag video from when the squadron went to red flag. And we had a bunch of deliberate force video. It was all in a classified. So I stitched it all together, 
get it to music, and we're going to try and do that now. Yeah, yeah, let him in.
we go so there were a couple things to note on that you will note on a couple of the bridges and you might not have noticed and now people are going to roll back and take a look at the bridges but i know they're going to do that so a couple of the bridges had holes in them and one of the things we learned about bridges is that f-16s dropping a pair of mark 82s bombs so gbu-12s laser guided bombs with a mark 82 they're only 500 pounds we're not going to bring down the bridge bridge they were going to blow holes in the deck so a number of those bridges were reattached by strike eagles carrying 2,000 pounders, like in the picture behind you. And the 2,000 pounder definitely drops an entire bridge span, uh, one or two of them, uh, when you hit them. Uh, the other thing is that one of those bombs is a dud. It's in the late portion where a bomb comes streaking in, hits a building, strikes a bunch of sparks, and there's nothing. That was Joe Harrell's only combat drop. A Wizzo that actually taught me to fly Phantoms back in the F4 school, transitioned to the Strike Eagle, got to Lake and Heath before I did. And well, he, you know, gets out, he's he gets to fly his one combat sword, he had deliberate force, drops his bomb, hits the target, doesn't go off. Huge bummer. Was that the one where the, the puffs of smoke come out? Um, the vents in the building? I, I uh, that's a different one. That went okay. off. So that was a penetrator, yeah. and that went into the bunker, and you know it shelled out the bunker because all those vents, um, you showed the gases coming out. Yeah, I love that yeah. shot. There, there was also, um, I, I spotted some um, threat system video in there, just a short clip. I think it's from an SA-8 maybe, maybe an SA-6 in the Nitter. It's uh, um, and it, I didn't get a timestamp for it. I'll put it in the description if I find it, well, I, well, which I will do. But it has the little sort of oscillator to, sort of display at the bottom with a little peak yep. in the middle. So that's the that's visual tracking, but it's using, is it a rangefinder or something like that to, you tell so us about it. Is, because that's from one of the threat simulators. Okay. Um, so it's it'll show you what threat it's simulating. But it's a manned threat simulator. So that's unclassified uh, video, obviously, in which you're showing the signal strength okay from the return that's what that is is it's is the radar is basically wired for other visual indications that an operator wouldn't get to put it all on the video and that way you could see if they were jamming or chaff having an effect although if they were jamming having an effect that would have classified the video and you wouldn't have seen it um so that was just our one unclassified clip of uh threat video from red flag uh because it showed a uh, f15 racing along above the ridge line but that's that's how one of the things one of the ways you get your training yeah. is you've got actual operators running threat simulators I and think... that is part of the debrief process everybody's favorite part where you've gotten in you've gotten out and you know some guy who's just come back from showtime with all the video says okay well we're gonna play back the threat video and you know this guy got shot down and this guy got shot down. good use of chaff here you know, this guy fly behind a mountain before timeout. And so that's a regular part of a training debrief. That's one of the great things about Nellis. Yeah. Uh, is to, but these guys behind those operator behind those systems, those operators are really good. Yeah. I think I've, I've seen footage of the chaff, uh, chaff being used against that. Uh, and you can see the little spike uh, sort of getting pulled off of the, the cent from the, away from the center of the screen, which I guess represents the, the, the airplane strike eagle. So um, that was a cool video. I really like that. I mean, uh, even though, yeah. I mean, it's difficult nowadays because you, everything's GoPro and it's all 4K and 
it's instant. You know, it was yesterday that somebody recorded it and it's online today and a million people are watching it. But that that was cool. Yeah, so these are three quarter inch Betamax tapes. This is before we had the eight millimeter in the airplane that were then transliterated to VHS that then I copied to another VHS that then I eventually digitized. Well, good for you. Well, good for everybody because that's cool. Um, so that's kind of where that's the the squadron I was coming into where we, you know, we were running around Europe, we were doing European things. And, um, you know, I still had my, remember, I don't get my first Sam kill till the very end of 1998. So I'm still yeah. carrying my inferiority complex along. Uh, and one of the more fun, go. I was going to say, I was going to say, um, before we get to you sort of closing in on, on sort of killing that. Uh, inferiority complex you did mention in passing but i think it's been something that we've talked about before or that has been discussed on discord but your visit to finland you said oh yeah a brief okay. exchange with them. can you tell us about that yes yeah, so um the Finns, of course are not nato but in the in the mid 90s the nato spun up what was called a partnership for peace which was just an exercise regimen that technically could have included the the russians um and the Partnership for Peace Nations were non-NATO, but they were people you could exercise with. And once they got that opportunity, the Finns made the decision that they were going to switch away from big engine MiG-21s to big engine F-18s. So it may not be clear to, um, to everybody that the Finnish F-18s were C's and D's, and they had the big engines and the new radar. And they bought a bunch of them, and they, they took a couple as factory assembled kits that were flown to Finland as factory assembled from St. Louis to Finland. And then they accepted the rest on kits shipped to them where they assembled them in Finland. And so they had to build a force that was able to handle the big jump from MiG-21 to advanced fourth generation fighter. And the, one of the first things they did is they took two of their pilots, uh, uh, Jarmo Chuck Lindbergh, was one of them, 21st Fighter Squadron Commander. And they sent him to a Navy FTU and then to a short course at the Navy Test Pilot School. And his ops officer, Kim, they did the same thing with him. And so now they they felt they were technically adept. They wanted to know how to fly the Hornet, but they didn't want to ask the Navy. And the reason they didn't want to ask the Navy is because their view was, the U.S. Navy flew the Hornet as a bomber, and they needed to know how to fly it as a fighter. So they went to General Jumper, who was uh, John Jumper, was the commander of the uh, United States Air Forces in Europe at the time. And they said, hey, we want to learn about air-to-air, -air, AMRAMs, which we're buying, four-ship air-to-air tactics, beyond visual range tactics. Oh, and by the way, we'd like to know a little about harm. And so the message came out to Lake and Heath fighter crews and said, Hey, the Finns are coming to visit us. And we would like to, we would like to give them a bunch of briefings, any volunteers. And I volunteer immediately. Most guys were not interested because that just meant extra work, but that also meant that they weren't thinking ahead. <laughs> so um, we had our light gray guys there, the 492nd fighter squadron, the Reapers and they gave a bunch of briefs and we talked about multi-ship tactics and formations and AMRAM shots all at a very low classification level. And I gave what was essentially an unclassified brief about the harm and defense suppression. And they came and they went. And then a little bit later, so this would have been 1998-ish um, in the spring. And in the summer, we get an invite to go to Finland and they want the guys that briefed them. So we're going to fly to Finland with two strike eagles and a C model eagle. And we're going to go up and we're going to go to the 21st fighter squadron in Tampere, Finland is going to be our host. And then we've got an additional air show commitment uh, after that to go up to Oulu, which is just south of the Arctic Circle. And so we fly up and we've got one jet with an air show loadout bombs and so on the other jet with the cargo pods. I'm flying the jet with the cargo pods. I mean, yes, it's not sexy, but if I divert, I have my underwear. <laughs> okay. And I've got all that extra spare clothing if the other jet doesn't divert with me. So you always fly the airplane with the cargo pods. It doesn't matter how shiny you're looking. And we're flying up the Baltic and I wanted to actually paint the cargo pods silver. 
because all of our training nuclear weapons are, are bright silver. Um, and the idea behind that is so you can detect nicks and scratches and so on. But I'd have loved to, to just fly out with a bunch of silver, you know, oblong shapes up the Baltic in case the Russians intercepted us, but nobody else wanted to go for that idea. So I've got my normal, you know, dark gray combat or uh, cargo pods. And the Finns are waiting with a photography jet. And as we're coming into Finland up from the Baltic, uh, I've got the low search. I'm the, I'm the wingman. I have the low search and I've got the search and I see this guy on the deck just smoking along and so I light him up at like 40 something nautical miles and I track him and I see the guy smoking on the deck and then I, you know, call him out to the four ship and I break lock to monitor the rest because I just wanted to see what was going on. That was the squadron commander with a photographer in the back seat. And their plan was to sneak up at us, do an Immelman and come up behind us unawares. That plan, as he told me later, went completely out the window when he gets spiked at 40 nautical <laughs> miles and realizes that then the second problem is air traffic control will not give them clearance to climb. <laughs> but here we are sailing up at like 28,000 feet and this jet's smoking on the deck and can't get clearance to climb. And there he goes. So anyway, they got us together. We got some good Hornet and Strike Eagle uh, photographs and Eagle, the light gray, as we come in. And uh, the light gray pilot, you know, was really pushing his luck because he'd just undergone a vasectomy and he <sighs> probably wasn't really good to fly. And he certainly wasn't good to pull G's. That'll feed into the story later. <laughs> so we land in Tampere and it's June and we're in Finland and we're going to go out for dinner. We've got a bunch of briefings. We're going to fly the next day. I'm going to fly in the simulator. And the simulator is a pretty neat simulator. It's a dome. And... The guys say, yeah, we'll stop drinking when it gets dark. This is a huge <laughs> thing. Okay. For those of you that don't live in high or low latitudes, in summer in Finland, it doesn't get dark. I mean, the sun technically goes down, but it doesn't really get dark. So your normal timing is, is out of whack. So there we are. You know, we're in Finland. I eat a dinner i have like reindeer noses or whatever i happen to eat i eat a lot of reindeer and salmon and it always says reindeer noisettes on the menu so we translated that as reindeer noise noses so reindeer noses are quite good do not make jokes about radioactive reindeer in finland in the 90s they don't think it's funny uh so i go to bed i wake up in the next morning and there's no signs of life in the hotel and i go down and i get breakfast you've got your standard finished breakfast which all i remember is the bucket of raw fish uh and whatever else they happen to be serving but there were things that you could actually eat that weren't the bucket of raw fish and i tried it because you know why wouldn't i and it wasn't bad it was just not something i'd eat for breakfast every day of the week uh even though i'm stationed in england at the time uh you know, so it wasn't holding up well, even in those circumstances. <laughs> and I, I have to start waking up dudes, you know, because we, we're going to be picked up. And I'm waking up guys 30 minutes before we're supposed to leave the hotel. And they, they're they wasted. They're just completely gone. And so now I'm the only one on the flying schedule because I'm the only one that's going to be ready to fly until the 12 hours bottle the throttle. So they're not going to be ready to fly till late afternoon. And I think they're pushing that. So I'm in the simulator relearning the HOTAS because when the Finns say you're going to fly their Hornets, they mean you're going to fly their Hornets. So two-seat model, I'm going to be in the back, obviously, but I'm in the front le relearning the HOTAS and I'm, I'm doing the simulator thing. And it's a dome simulator. And rather than have the whole thing be high res, there is a camera that is slaved to your headset. So wherever you look, wherever that high resolution circle where your eyes are high res, that's projected on the side. So they liked it as a training aid because they could always tell where their pilots were looking. And that was one of the earlier distributed simulators. So they could hook up with the Finnish pilots in Switzerland mm. and fly missions against or with the guys in, in Switzerland. So it was kind of neat. And, you know, I, I figured out the hotess. I, I went one V six with a bunch of flankers and, uh, I had two AMRAMs and four heaters, which is two heaters more than the Finns usually carry. So the Finns, when they're on air defense, no tanks, two slammers, two heaters, no drag. Okay, They're just going to go up. They're going to rage against the Russians. They're going to land, reload, and they're going to be back in the air. And that's that was their idea at the time. 
So, you know, I, I, they put me up against six flankers and I bag two flankers BVR. I shoot the third one in the face. I shoot the fourth one in the face. And I'm in a turning fight with the fifth one, having lost track of number six when the visual fails in the simulator. We have to bring the whole thing down before I get totally embarrassed uh, because I haven't <laughs> been able to keep track of number six. And it was like, wow, you know, you're a Wizzo. It's like, yeah, I'm a Wizzo. I know. See, wings, Wizzo, you know, the whole thing. And then we went out and flew the airplane and we flew a BFM ride. And the fins fly with a 500 meter air combat floor. And they fly over forest land. Just so you know, every place in Finland is forest land with lakes. So Minnesota has a license plate that says land of 10,000 lakes. The fins know that. And they sneer at it because they have <laughs> 80,000 lakes in Finland. 80,000. They say, yeah, you have to be really poor to not have lakeside property in Finland as your summer. I mean, you might not have a structure on it, but we we were flying over this green. And so when the Air Force flies air to air like that, full up maneuvering, we fly with a 5,000 foot floor. And I did not realize that they expected me to fly the BFM from the back. Okay, I wasn't going to ride along and comment to the pilot. I was flying it. So fights on my jet. Well, I have two problems. One is, I have three problems. Problem one is I'm a wizzo. You know, and uh, my BFM skills exist, but they're not something I'd want to show off in front of a, an Air Force that goes air to air and only air to air all the time, right? The second thing is that I don't realize that the thing has a G limiter. So I'm overly ginger with the stick because I don't want to break their brand new airplane because I would feel bad. And then the third problem is that every time I get my nose low, I get this face full of green because it's a 500 meter floor and I'm probably below 5,000 feet and I roll wings level and bring the nose up. And so I'm a straight rag. I mean, the guy's just, I wasn't even good training for the adversary, right? It's like, hey, this is this is what you get when you fly an airplane uh, against an airplane where the guy on the stick sucks at his job. <laughs> so <laughs> not my favorite position, but it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I learned a bunch of things. And the other thing that's cool is that the, the, HUD display is not in knots. It's in kilometers per hour. Uh. So you could be subsonic and see a thousand on the airspeed display. And that's freaking cool. You feel like you're smoking. You're not smoking. Um, I mean, you are kind of, but you are not smoking. Like if it's, if it's on a 111 tape and it says a thousand, then you're smoking. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we did the exchange. The guys managed to get sober enough to fly and not hit each other or anything attached to the ground. Um, and we learned a lot about their operations and then, you know, we briefed a lot. Now we're in their environment and we can talk other stuff, you know, with a foreign disclosure office officers that said, this is what you talk about. We talk about foreign ship tactics and it's, it's kind of a multi-day seminar. And then we go to Awulu because a former Finnish fighter squadron commander had arranged for us to go to an air show and they've got their annual air show up there. And that's where I saw the, the. Russian MiG-29 aerial demo team, bunch of drunks, and the a MiG-25 Foxbat. That's where I got my exposure to an operational Foxbat at the time. And we fly up, and on the way, the Finns told us that they had a, an agreement with the Swedes that any time Finland or Sweden flew an actual air-to-air -air exercise with foreign jets, they had to notify the other. So on our flight up, we start talking on the radio like we're in a full up 4v4 engagement. We talk, we've we've got our thing, we talk contact, we talk groups, we talk eyeballs, we talk the sort, we talk the shots. We are straight and level over nothing but forest. And the next day the Finns told us the Swedes called them up and said, What's the deal? You know, you guys are flying with the Americans. And the Finns said, Yeah, so just why don't you just actually take a look at the ground track of the aircraft? But thanks for telling us you were listening. <laughs> So that was kind of a little sting operation to see if the Swedes were listening and the Swedes were listening. Um, they just weren't correlating everything. So we land in Ulu and there's nobody coming out with chocks. And the F-15E's parking brake only works while, there's, while the engines are turning. Once the hydraulic pressure goes away, the parking brake slips off. So it's like the Phantom, although Royal Air Force Phantoms actually had a real parking brake. American Phantoms did not. You take hydraulics off and the brakes go. So that's, you got to chalk your wheels. Nobody's coming out with chocks. 
So Jack Ruby, I'm in the he's in the front seat. Um, he says, Star Baby, I'm gonna shut down the left engine and you're gonna go back there into the forest and you're gonna find us something to chalk the tires with. <laughs> And I said, okay, because it's Finland, right? And like I said, everything's forest. So around the airfield is forest. Shuts down the left engine. I climb out. I go back into the forest and find a bunch of four by fours that construction crew had left behind. So I come back out and we chalk the airplane with four by fours, which is perfect. And we shut down. And eventually somebody comes out with chalks, but that's what we were waiting for. And they come out with the air stairs for the other aircraft. And we have a great air show. Um, you know, we talk smack with the Russians and we look at their cockpits and they look at our cockpits only he has round dials and I have multifunction displays. So all he's seeing is a blank screen and I'm looking at his dials and we assure each other that we would be happy to go up in the air and kill each other at a moment's notice, <laughs> just for old time's sake. Uh, each of us thinking that we're better. And of course I know that I'm better. So that's, you know, I'm not too worried about this Russian big 25 pilot sm talking smack about his uh, little drag strip airplane or big drag strip airplane as the case may be. And we're eating salmon. And the, the guy that arranged the air show is a former Finnish fighter squadron commander. So he'd arranged guides for all the air crew. We had guys to take us everywhere. Undergraduate women from the local university. Okay. It was awesome, you know, because we got the full up tour, you know, we pay for all the, 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 the food, the alcohol, we have local, and uh, very ornamental uh, escorts who were interested in aviation and they wouldn't have volunteered for it. It was a good time. And then there was the Royal Air Force. So I've said before that I've never deployed with a raging pack of alcoholics like the Royal Air Force. And so what had flown in, there were some good airplanes. I mean, the, the Spanish flew in RF-4s and I didn't see them first. I heard the engines. It's like, oh, J-79s. You know, they land a couple RF-4s. They still had their paradise intake covers because they had been ex-Air Guard aircraft from Reno. Um, And uh, from the High Rollers was the squadron there at the time. And that was, they they were there and the Royal Air Force flies in a Nimrod. <laughs> now, a Nimrod is this, you know, old dark green anti-submarine warfare airplane with engines embedded in the wing roots and uh after an unsuccessful and i think catastrophic short-lived career as an airliner and they come in with four or five thousand pounds worth of alcohol worth of alcohol and and of course they're from scotland right so they're just you know shoveling it into the airplane and they got some air stairs from finnair and they turned during air show hours they turned this into the air crew bar and they got the air stairs so you can go up. And you need one of two things to get into the bar. A flight suit or a skirt. <laughs> and just in case you didn't leave your airplane, there were two Royal Air Force aviators. One who walked around with a cardboard box with a selection of fine scotch. Uh, they tell me it's fine scotch. I don't drink it. So, you know, it, it could be lighter fluid for all I know. And the other guy has a selection of shot glasses. So they're walking around and they are the portable air crew bar. So that all the other air crew of all nationalities around the air show don't miss out on the scotch. So during the day, I take a break. You know, I go up in the air stairs. I go into the airplane and I have never been in an airplane that smelled like that. <laughs> so one of the things they had brought around for reasons that are not clear to me is a case of French wine. And in the manhandling, moving stuff back and forth, they had dropped the case of French wine and shattered at least a couple bottles. So there was there was wine that had been flowing on the floor of the airplane and it was hot and the wine was sticky. And so it smelled. And so I I go out. They've got the overwing exits open. So I go out an overwing exit and there is at least two women and a Royal Air Force crew mixing 151 Bacardi rum with ch mint chocolate chip ice cream. And. They're spilling it everywhere because they're pretty hammered. And they're spilling it into what looks like the aux air intake on the number one and two engines. And I'm thinking to myself, this airplane is not getting out of here come Monday morning. And so, you know, really, I there's nothing there for me in terms of there's nothing there I want to drink. The airplane smells like a dumpster, you know, outside a pub on a hot day. And so I leave and I go back down. We finish the air show. 
And we're going to leave. Time for us to go home. We've got a tanker arranged. We've got to fly around Sweden. We can't overfly Sweden. Um, we're going to do the Baltic again. We take off. And the landing gear won't come up. We're done. We cannot make it to the nearest NATO base with our landing gear hanging. We can't land to, uh, divert to Sweden um, because they'll intern us. Oh, in retrospect, being interned by the Swedes would not have been the worst thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> and so we come back around, we land the two ship, and it's like, what now? And it's like, well, we got to send out a maintenance crew. And how long is that going to take? Well, it's going to take 10 days. Um, because what they it's not the it's a 50 cent part. It's the weight on wheel switch. Hmm. But after they replace that part, they have to jack the airplane up and cycle the put the hydraulics on it and cycle the landing gear 100 times before they they pronounce it good, which means trucks, jacks, maintenance personnel. They have to drive it because we have we don't have our own airlift. So they have to drive from England to Finland with all this gear. We're going to be there for 10 days. And the. uh the hotel we're staying at, they have a veterans convention coming in. They're not going to be with us. There's no room. We have to get out. And my room was great. It had its own sauna. Uh, and so we have to leave and we get reservations in a youth hostel, which does not have curtains, which is bad when it doesn't get dark. So and plus the roller skating people, I mean, teenagers roller skating up and down the hallways at two o'clock in the morning. Not my thing either. But the Brits, the Brits don't. They can't get their airplane out either. Why not? Because it was freaking drunk. I mean, <laughs> they say it had a hydraulic failure, but nobody that was there believes that. So they start living out of their rental cars and billing, you know, sending notes to the British embassy in Helsinki to send them money. <laughs> but they don't get lodging with their money. Okay, They just stay drunk for the rest of the week. They're living out of their cars. They're drinking up the leftover stash. And they finally, you know, they're there for another five days while their airplane gets fixed. So, you know, we took the time. We drove up north of the uh, Arctic Circle. I got my obligatory um, reindeer skin. I had gotten and kept the phone numbers from a number of our guides because I always had a little green address book. So I called up some of our guides and said, hey, we're still here and we're still willing to buy dinner. So where are we going? And so we were traveling around. You know, we visited actually one of our guides got appendicitis. And, you know, so we visited her. Um, but it was fun. That was Finland. It was a great air to air exchange. I got to fly Finnish airplanes. I ate a lot of reindeer and smoked salmon. And there were various shenanigans going uh, around, you know, mostly by the Royal Air Force. But, you know, let's not forget the Russians. Uh, great air show experience in Finland. That's what you want Europe to be about. And, you know, I was in a position where if we'd suddenly kicked off with Nimble Lion, you know, we'd been stuck in Finland. We had no way to get to it. You know, we might have very well uh, abandoned the aircraft, uh, you know, shipped a guard up and... Uh, uh, flown home to be with the squadron, but it didn't happen. So I got an extra vacation in Finland with uh, Norm Peterson was my pilot and uh, a, a good time was had by all. D so that's the longer version of the Finland story. What do you, what should I, what did I miss? <laughs> uh, I was going to say, don't, don't you guys have, or didn't, doesn't Lake and Heath have a, an association with the 100th Air Refueling Wing at uh, Mildenhall? Could they not have bung some stuff on a KC-135 and flown it out to you? Maybe, but they didn't. <laughs> I'm sure if they'd said to the tanker task force, hey, we need you to haul a bunch of cargo up to Finland and wait while they fix an airplane, the tanker guys would have gone, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't happen. It was all trucks. So, And I'm sure the maintenance guys that were selected, hey, you got to go to Finland for 10 days. It's like, okay. <laughs> so best that was the best of my NATO uh, exchanges. You know, and I was, uh, I had fun that way. So t t to get me back to the whole... Oh, go ahead. Before before you get back to the whole Lick and Heath thing, which is which was even though we it feels like a long time ago, what we were talking about. Um, t tell tell us about a little bit about the Finnish Air Force then. So it's interesting you say they've got that sort of fifteen hundred foot, uh, five hundred meter, uh, safe, uh, you know, hard deck or whatever you call it um, f for training purposes. I heard the Swedes are similar in that you know they would just fly super fast. I, I'd heard some, from some RAF guys who flew. Um, tornadoes and jaguars and we're used to flying at 100 feet or maybe even 50 feet you know where where it was not completely crazy that uh, that the swedes were just in a league of their own they would just fly at you know 
zero feet, you know, effectively, you know, and as fast as they wanted to. Um, so, so it was a, an education even for an RAF pilot to go into that environment. But what were the what were the fins like then as aviators, and how much of an impact? And, and we are definitely off on a tangent, but how much of an impact did the stuff you were doing then, you and the light grey guys, and I should say you called it the 492nd, the Grim Reaper guys would be saying, no, we're 493rd. Um, but, but but how much of an impact did oh. you did you think that visit had on on the, the, the fins and their ability to employ? I think they were ready to accept us and they were, I was, I had never been so impressed by a foreign air force. This is my second assignment in NATO. Um, they were ready to absorb. They had the aviation skills. They they were just adding things in, like how to work a radar and how to do the long range comm. And they were absolutely primed. One of the things the Finns pointed out, uh, Chuck Lindbergh, the squadron commander, has pointed out is that the Finns have a higher per capita ACE rate hmm. after the Winter War and the Continuation War, uh, 1939 and 1942 than any other country in the world. And they did it with like leftover Fokkers and Brewster Buffaloes, uh, just horrible little aircraft. And of course, you know, they were shooting down Russians, but they they definitely had the aviation skill set, their highway strip capacity, their air base design, their shelters, the way they prepared to operate. I mean, these guys were the real thing. I, I had no question um, about the capabilities of the Finnish Air Force. I thought that, you know, what they advertised as their capabilities, where they were absolutely going to be able to do defensive counter air with the possible addition of suppressing some long range radars. Mm. Uh, but they had it and they had their own way of doing it. Like I said, two slammers, two heaters in the gun, no extra fuel, no drag. And the big engine F-18D, that, that is a performance machine. Uh, I saw the the pilot, you know, we're doing some aircraft handling before we get into the BFM. He says, watch this, 70 degree per second pitch rate. Bang, pulls back on the stick. We get a 70 degree per second pitch rate. Well, no, we only get it for one second. Uh, and we pissed away all our airspeed doing it, but it was still impressive. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I thought they were they were very capable. There's a there's a website. Unfortunately, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a Finnish website that that Colonel Lindbergh started that is still there, which talks about, you know, fighter aviation. They talk about tactics. They put a lot of the stuff out. Hmm. Um, yeah, they were really, really good. They're going to be a great addition to NATO. I, I visited the the Swiss in, I think, 2004. I, I was lucky to get a backseat ride in one of their Hornets, and they uh, had a similar spec, I think, APG-73, big engine, D-model. Uh, and we went up and we did sort of pirouette maneuver logic and all this kinds of stuff. And it was very, very cool. But one of the things that really sort of stayed with me was actually a conversation I had with them on the ground. And they were sort of unashamed about this in terms of they didn't say to me, don't repeat it. But they said they were pissed off because they had bought the APG-73 because it had good ground cluster rejection. Um, they're obviously operating in a very mountainous terrain and they wanted to be able to look down a lot and still lock stuff up at a reasonable range. And when they'd flown with the Navy, US Navy sent some F, uh, F, F, F-18s over there so they could you know, have a little play. They, they, they had found that the APG-73 operated well, performed well. But then when they bought their jets, their radar had clearly been detuned and they did not have the capability that they thought they bought. Um, did you get any sense from the Finns that they, they had had similar experiences? No, uh, nor did I see that on the radar. Um, but again, I was flying over, you know, 80,000 lakes and a bunch of trees. Um, so a different clutter environment. Um, I I got from the radar what I expected. What I really liked about the radar was a C-scope. So most of what you see on a on a air intercept radar is a B-scope, which is not the fan that you see in the Top Gun movies. That just pisses me off. Okay? It's it's a square. And it's it actually distorts the picture because in reality, the radar sweep is a fan, but you move those bottoms out to get a square. So, you know, the edge of the scope is still 60 right. And the edge of the scope is still 60 left. It's just straight instead of a fan. They ha And it's a top down. A B scope is a top down God's eye view. The Hornet has a C scope, which is a forward looking view that is a square and it is azimuth and elevation instead of azimuth in range. That was amazing because with a strike eagle, you know, the top down view, how do you determine a guy's, you know, altitude stack? And our answer is we determine it with the pod. 
uh, and the pod helps us out in clear air where we can get those hot spots. But the C-Scope, which is an amazing situational awareness tool, and I started trying to write it in to put a request so that that would be added to our software code. And of all people, the C-Model guys shot down the, the tape change every single time. I don't even know if the new Acer Raiders have a C-Scope. But, you know, I tried over several years to get a C-Scope in the end. It, it, it's the same radar manufacturer. It's the same aircraft manufacturer. We should have been able to get it. And guys who had not flown with it couldn't see the value. And guys who had flown it is like, oh, yeah, give me one of these. Wow. And so that was the big radar difference I, I noticed because yeah. I would, you know, I'd have a B scope up and I'd flip C scope and I'd see the elevation presentation. I'd go back to B. It was beautiful. I think actually in the Hornet, you can have one on each, can't you? On, on each display, you can have the, the B and one and elevation azimuths um, display on the other. So you can actually combine the two. In, you know, I, you don't, I suppose I, you could, but I had a HUD on the other. Ah, of course, yes. Okay, so take us back. Take us back to uh, Lake and Heath and your All um, right, so march to war. We Inferiority complex is where we left off, so I still got it. And so I am volunteering for every deployment. Right? You know, I go, to, I go to Turkey. You know, we go down to Aviano for deny flight, although we didn't do much in the deny flight front. You know, it was, it was outside the technical deny flight period, but we're still flying armed over Bosnia. Um, and we're we're flying missions, you know, we're trading with NATO JTACs on the ground, et cetera. It's still a, a, an armed NATO presence uh, over Bosnia. And I actually did a deployment with the other squadron. So uh, Blue Squadron, 492nd Fighter Squadron, the, the Mad Hatters, um, they... They were short. They were short experience crews. It wasn't that they were short crews. It's that they had the wrong experience, inexperience mix at the time. They said, hey, we need some experienced dudes. We get so we got some instructors. Uh, will you take, uh, you know, do you, did they go to red? Do you have spare crews you can send down to a deployment to Insulik? And of course, I volunteer because I have a bunch of other reasons. One, as we know, I've got an inferiority complex about missing the Gulf War, and I'll volunteer for any potential combat deployment. Two, I had two term papers that were due for my master's degree program, and that would have given me time to write them. Three, it was before Christmas, and I had a bunch of Christmas shopping I wanted to do in Turkey. And four, I wanted to get eight hours, or actually 10 hours of sleep a night every night for a month. So I could get all of those by going with another squadron. So they'd ask for an instructor EWO. We were short instructor EWOs, uh, which was a problem that was only getting worse because even those of us that were in the program at the time, we just could not get the sorties dedicated to the upgrade so we had a bunch of us that were in a frozen upgrade they said hey we can't spare an instructor but you take star baby and they said sure we'll take star baby so i became a fred which stands for former red since i was from the red squadron and i flew with blue for a month and it was it was fun and i got my term papers done and i got my christmas shopping done i got a lot of sleep and uh you know i'm ready to go so finally you know end of 1998 we're Things are getting ugly in the Balkans and uglier than they have been. We've had a bunch of false alarms, but it looks like things are spinning up. And but we're still we're in Turkey and the blue squadron is down in Aviano and red is in Turkey. And we're going to do a swap uh, in short order and change positions. And uh, Bat and I lead the four ship that gets a Sam kill on 28 December. So the specter of Desert Storm done behind me and now we're spinning up i go back home after that uh and we're getting ready we deploy an advanced team down to aviano and we start swapping out jets in early february mm -hmm. and late february february 23rd was the first deadline madeline albright u.s secretary of state sets a deadline for the serbs to stop massacring kosovar albanians by february 23rd so february 23rd uh, it's getting close. So on the 22nd, I fly down the night before we're going to kick off and go immediately in the crew rest, naturally in a four star hotel. And uh, as as we landed and I think we took a C-130 down, I think we took one of the Gucci CIA flown C-130s with uh, the, the passenger pallet. But um, we landed there and. I see the aircraft are loaded. I mean, they're in the shelters. Everything on the base is combat loaded. It's packed to the gills. We go immediately into crew rest. We're going to find the next day. You know, here's your schedule. Just be ready to rock. And of course, the deadline is extended for 30 days. 
and another Madeline Albright special where we're going to wait another 30 days and uh, for the Serbs to comply. Why we're giving somebody a bad actor those extra 30 days, I don't know. It might have been NATO politics, but it was a bad idea because that was going to cost uh, people on the ground. And sure enough, it did. But now what are we going to do for the next 30 days? So we can only do a little air to air training because the maintenance officers don't want to take the AMRAMs off the jet. Um, which I thought we should download more. So we download a couple of, of uh, aircraft with, so they're not carrying air-to-air -air missiles. And we could do a couple sorties over the Adriatic Sea in the F-16's airspace um, and practice some BFM. So just to get our basic squares. And we're basically flying rehearsals over Bosnia. And we built mission packages where we'd fly the mission package. We it, And... Army rehearses all the time. They're big about rehearsals. We, Air Force is not big about rehearsals. So we actually got to do rehearsals um, where we would take our strike planning for, like, say, Oberva Airfield and move the whole thing over to a different spot in Serbia and practice all the movements. And, I mean, we're flying those train their training sorties. We're flying with a load of uh, two heaters and two slammers uh, all the time, just on those training sorties, two tanks, of course. And, you know, we're setting up communications with guys on the ground. We're talking to the JTACs. We're actually doing some training with them. So it's not a lot of great stuff. I'm eating food. I buy a bicycle because I'm eating Italian food. And uh, so I was doing like 30 to 50K in the Alps every second or third day because I need to offset the Italian food because it's good. And as previously mentioned, <laughs> I'm stationed in England. Oh, you saw that coming. <laughs> And so suddenly there's now we have to send guys to the air operations center, Vicenza, the CAOC, not a good deal. You're out of flying for a week and you have to go down to the AOC at Vicenza. And I realized I'd much rather do my week during the spin up period than during combat ops. So I go down to Vicenza where I get my first real NATO experience and real NATO experience means a four and a half hour workday with two hours for lunch included. Um, and it's a three course meal at the officers club with beverages. I mean, this is fantastic. And so, you know, Dave Dodger and I are, are around and, and, you know, one pilot, one Wizzo, we're touring the museums. You know, we go through the palace at Verona where Romeo and Juliet is set. And I, I tap Dave on the shoulder. I say, excuse me, I just have to do this. And I step out onto a balcony and do an empty courtyard. I go, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? And I step back in and we move on with the rest of our tour. I mean, we saw the Coliseum. We ate, you know, we got some good food. It's very funny, but the, the Coliseum that we went to uh, uh, in the Verona area, I can't remember whether it was in Verona, but the old slave quarters are converted to a youth hostel, which I thought was freaking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we showed where they had the, the pools in the so that you could have gladiatorial ship battles and stuff like that. It was it was an excellent one week. And like I said, with a four and a half hour workday, including lunch, it was bonus. And then we come back. Um, And the other military facility up there, which is about three hours away, is Vi is Ver Vicenza. Um, maybe it's less distance. And uh, it also has the army post because in addition to having the air operations center, uh, Vicenza has the 173rd uh, parachute infantry brigade, 173rd airborne. And so that's the other big facility. And Aviano is a great air base and it has great food. But one day as we're waiting, a bunch of lieutenants come up to me and, hey, star baby, you want to go to Vicenza? And I think they're going to go to the stereo store because the electronics store at Vicenza is bigger than the one at Aviano. So they're going to go shopping for electronics. We're getting $73 a day per diem. They probably got money burning a hole in their pocket. And But I, I ask, I say, so what are you going there for? We're going for Taco Bell. Let me get this straight. You are sitting here in Aviano, Italy. You are surrounded by the best cuisine in the world. And you are going to drive three hours one way to go to Taco Bell. And the guy doesn't get my tone. It's like, yeah, you want to go? <laughs> no, but thanks for asking. And off they go on their Taco Bell run. You know, three hours one way to go to Taco Bell. 
And, you know, in a good squadron, and the 494th at the time was a good squadron. 492nd was a pretty good squadron, even though we view them as the slack squadron down the street. Um, you know, so we we had mixed crews. We were now the 494th Expeditionary Fighter Squadron, which was pretty much most of red and a half of blue. And we're down there. So we got a bunch of lieutenants and the squadron commander, uh, War Dog, Warren Henderson. War Dog says, OK, in the run up. Um, hey, no alcohol. You know, you guys need to stop getting blasted. And uh, a good squadron in a good squadron. It's the captains that handle all the kind of discipline and mentorship and stuff. And, you know, in terms of mentorship, it can be anything like I remember walking up to Fang Moeller, who, you know, got his call sign. He's always had his fangs out. Good guy, made colonel, um, retired in Hawaii, as I recall. And Fang has just had an exchange with our squadron commander. And I walk up and I put my arm around Fang's shoulder and I say, the proper response when the squadron commander tells you to do something is yes, sir, and not you got it, dude. That's the kind of thing that goes on in a good squadron, right? So we had another conversation. You know, we I was off in the town of Bedoya, four-star hotel, and a couple of our lieutenants get blasted. And so Rich Piercy, who's another uh, weasel guy, and I just, you know, call him in and start to, okay, so which part of the squadron commander's thou shall not get blasted directive did you guys not understand? And we're just about to rip him up one side and down the other when they go into the full... Yeah, we're sorry. It'll never happen again. Completely take the winds out of my sail. I've got a good ass chewing building up and now I got nothing. So it's like, oh, OK. And they didn't. You know, <laughs> it just took a little bit of correction. That was a good squatter. So now the new deb uh, 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 deadline is March 23rd. There's a couple other weird things happening, like uh, Ted Koppel, who is an American investigative reporter, uh, part of a show called 2020. Um comes to visit and they're coming to visit Aviano and they just so happen they, they want to come up in the control tower during the afternoon when I'm pushing soft. And it's like, oh no, I'm not letting you up here. And it's like, well, why not? Because you can see the whole base. You know, you can film, you can tell where everything's disposed. We're not giving you any elevation. Um, And I made the instant rule that when Ted Koppel walks into your squadron, walk the hell out because nothing good is going to happen for having a, a reporter in your squadron. I mean, those guys are just... You know, he's not an aviation reporter who at least might have half a clue and is interested in maintaining his access. He's an investigative reporter that you're never going to see again. Mm -hmm. So eventually I you know, tried to get a call to get myself overruled, and I did. They let the guys up in the tower. Um, but that was the kind of thing going on. And, you know, one morning, again, it's kind of slow. And I there's this call comes out on the intercom, and the, we're all in the 555th fighter squadron. They have 16s, the triple nickel. So they have an 18 jet fighter squadron, which means they probably have 24 pilots. And we brought down 36 plus strike eagles with, you know, a good crew ratio. So we completely overran their squadron. They were very good about it. Fingers Goldfein was a squadron commander at the time. But they were great hosts. But we're still, I mean, we're packed in like sardines and, you know, we're looking for things to do. We have to share computers. So our productivity's down. And a call comes out. Hey, uh, anybody available, come to the duty desk. And it's not to fly. So I wander up to the duty desk because I got nothing better to do. And there's two Franciscan monks standing there. And the guy behind the duty desk says, hey, um, these guys are interested in a flight line tour. I say, sure, let's give them a flight line tour. So one of them speaks English and the other one doesn't. And it's exactly what you'd expect, right? It's two guys in brown, you know, kind of cassocks with a rope tying it and with sandals. Well, one of them is a fine scale modeler. And so this is his opportunity to get and take a look at a bunch of, of actual airplanes. So I'm not only going to show him the Strike Eagles, but I'm going to show him, you know, Vipers or whatever else happens to be around in our immediate area. So I've got a line badge and I walk out and I'm escorting these two guys in brown cassocks around, only one of whom speaks English. So he's translating everything else into Italian. And I'm getting questions, you know, about the munitions, about the tanks, all the kind of question, the guy isn't like fishing for information. He wants to know how he can make a better 148 scale model, right? Because I guess, you know, making wine and beer and illuminating manuscripts gets boring. <laughs> and so, you know, one jet, he decides, um, he asked me if, about the jets and the names and everything. And I, I 
say, well, the we don't necessarily get to fly our jet because he was going to bless the jet. Uh. And so they bless the jet that I took them out on a tour and I explained it was not my airplane. And they said, that's okay. And they did the whole fleet. Really? We had two monks less than a week prior to opening hostilities bless the entire Strike Eagle fleet lead at Lake and Heath. And I came back down in the squadron and, you know, they were happy to go. And I, you know, I let them out and I went back to War Dog and I said, well, Colonel, you know, we just had a couple of monks bless our whole fleet. I was like, well, that can't hurt. So there we go. The, the, the Franciscan monks in the squadron. And I'm totally glad I did that tour because as you can tell, I love to talk about airplanes. So now we're going to kick off. It's pretty clear that the, the 23 March is going to be it. And uh, Dave Dodger and I uh, are going to be crewed together. He was a guy who was a good pilot. Uh, Dave Dodger was also um, Bud Zero One in the Sam Kill. A uh, former 111 guy. Um, you'll hear his voice on a tape in like part two or three or something like that. And we're, I'm working with Cowboy Hughes. And the way the targeting was designed up, so Nimble Lion was 100 targets three days. And that's it. 100 that targets was, for, the, for, for the 494th or 100 targets no, for? 100 targets for NATO over three days. Mm. Because the geniuses at Supreme Allied Powers Europe, led by General Wesley Clark, who was an army general, um, it, they, hey, we're going to bring the Serbs to their knees in three days. And I remember one F-16 driver, you know, in the planning beforehand saying, yeah, when we kick this off, we're not going to solve this in three days. And the Serbs are going to use this opportunity to start slaughtering Albanians by the truckload is exactly what he said, of course. And the captain had correctly predicted the way the war was going to go when the four star and the crowd in shape uh, couldn't do it. And they didn't have a good contingency plan. And this all came out in, in later books. So the first night, the F-16s, it's their base. So they get to plan the first night strikes. And the second night strikes, the Strike Eagles get to plan. So Cowboy Hughes and I are planning the strike in Oberver Airfield. And uh, Cowboy, and I don't remember who his his wizard, we split the mission commander. So he's the mission commander. I'm the deputy mission commander. We're in different jets. Because if we lose one of the jets, we still want one of us, you know, on hand. So I don't remember who his Wizzo is, and and I'm flying with Dave Dodger. But we planned, Cabo and I planned out that strike. We had Canadians, F-18s, Jeep flight. We had Mirage 2000Ds from France. And the Mirage 2000D guys, I'll talk about them in a in a minute. They were really good. We had F-16s for Seed. Um, I seem to think we had F-15Cs for Seed. They were down at Budoya, our, our own guys. For OCA. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, we had the the C models for OCA. Uh, they can't even spell seed. Um, I'm not sure they're they, they can't spell DCA either because of the D. Um, but they were gonna be there, and we had a couple tornado ECRs. And I think that uh the prowlers, of course, Navy or Marine Corps, we had you know, Navy and Marine Corps prowlers all over the base, and that was gonna be our strike package, and, and we were ready to roll. So the French guys, uh, when they rolled in Desert Storm, they had let their skill set slip. By the time nine, eight years later, when they rolled into Allied Force, they had rebuilt their skill set up to the point where they could have, they were good planners as well. Um, because in Desert Storm, they were rotten planners. But now they were good planners. So probably my best planner was the French Mirage 2000D guy. Um, and, you know, he explained what we had and, you know, we had to deconflict from the stealth guys and all that. And in the planning, we planned all our routes and we planned the altitudes because we need to go in at different altitudes for different reasons. So the targeting pod and the strike Eagle at the time shut off if you flew above 25,000 feet because the, the pump could not pressurize the laser waveguide. And if you got, if the density of the atmosphere inside the waveguide was too low, you would arc and you'd burn it up and you wouldn't get a laser. So 25,000 feet, the software shuts it off whenever you exceed it. The Mirage 2000 guys had a fixed altitude. They had to be a fixed altitude above the target. They didn't have any playroom. Uh, and so we had to work that in. And then we work our plan and the stealth guys come in and say, oh, you can't do that. And it's like, why not? Because we're going to be out there first and you're not going to see us and you might hit us. 
So this is the altitude we're going to be at. Stay clear of that. So we re-wicker the plan. Is, it the, is this 117s or B2s you're talking about? 117s. Talking to 117 guys because they were at Aviano. The B2s were elsewhere um, in England eating low-quality food. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so um, then we replanned. And they they came back and they said, no, you got to replan again. We changed our altitudes and didn't tell you. <laughs> it's like we're not replanning okay here are our altitudes you avoid us or make your time or be out of the way and you know i i was asking planning questions i'm asking a stealth guy i said okay well because i'm not getting good confidence that there's a seed campaign going on and so i want to know what the 117s are targeting because i i've seen target lists and i have not seen the interceptor operations center so you're your sector operations center for air defense would typically have smaller operations centers, uh, uh, nominally an IOC, for example, but it could be a, uh, a a SAM or radar operations center. And I would expect to see these, and you know, I don't see you targeting them. And I get the wave off from a F one seventeen colonel saying, "Yeah, we'll we'll target those. They're going to be gone by the time you guys roll in." It's like, okay, that was bullshit. We did not know where the Serb IOCs were, and we never knew where the Serb IOCs were. So I just got this hand-waving from a stealth guy after they've screwed our plans a couple of times, and obviously I'm still pissed about it. And what we did not know at the time is that there were two air tasking orders. There was the U.S.-only ATO, which had cruise missiles, stealth aircraft and the guys supporting them so the prowlers and the sea models that were supporting them they were all in the u.s only ato i was on the nato st ato where a lot of the you know where everything else is flying and we had no idea that a u.s only ato existed different guys flying different missions and so that was not helpful that was not good for coordination it didn't make sense it was security compartmentalization for bad reasons and we get ready to kick it off and the first night goes well um, you know, and the F-15s rage and bag a couple of MiGs. And I kind of watched that happen on the big screen in the mission planning cell. And we get ready to go for the second night. And now I want to know if we're going to break and put a break in here so we could go to part two. <laughs> Let me do this. There we go. All right. That's my, that's okay, my signal. So, we've no. taken a break. All right. So we've taken a break. So thanks for inviting me back, even though it's only 69 seconds after I last said, let's go to part two. This is also you don't you know so that the viewers don't have to listen to this god awful collection of me talking for three hours as cool <laughs> as I think that is. It, other people might need to take a break, and we want them to come back. So anyway, part two: hostilities kick off in Kosovo, and Oberva is going to be our target. And we roll in over Oberva is an airfield. Uh, it's got some jets at it. It's an alternate MiG-29 base. It's got a long runaway, 8,000 feet. It has a resident SA-3 uh, battery. And we're going to rage in with GBU-24s. And um, the Canadians and the and the French are actually going to hit off airfield targets. I'm going to hit the command bunker is number three. One, two, and four are going to hit the SA-3 uh, position. Five and six are going to hit fuel storage. The F-16s, I don't know what they were scheduled to hit. I think hangars. I mean, they missed them all anyway, so <laughs> typical F-16 shit. Um, and I'll actually talk about that as a reason for it. Uh, and it's not necessarily their fault. I just prefer to blame them. And so we've got the the package, and it's night. It's, it's night, and I have gotten the biggest roast beef sandwich of my life to prepare for this night because at the at the base the commissary they were giving you an entire loaf of italian bread cutting it in half stuffing it with meat and they only charged you for the loaf of the bread and the weight of the meat and cheese oh. so you get one of these and it's three meals in a sandwich so that's what i had now i'm because if you're going to night fly you're going to sleep during the day you're kind of going to be off italian food so we're on giant sandwiches and the greek food stand on the base so there we are. We're in ingress. Everything's going well. GBU 24s, 2,000 pound bombs, laser guided. That's the picture behind Steve right now. Is uh, That's actually much later. That's in April. That's uh, me and uh, Russ Lee, Ugg, in the front seat. But a uh, pair of GBU 24, Paveway 3, and we're going to saunter in. And the first thing that goes wrong is that the German Tornado ECRs go by 
with all their lights on their cannon flight and we go cannon your lights are on and it's like yeah we like it that way so this is our first hint that the germans took the peace dividend a little too seriously and what we later found out is the germans did not do training sorties at night after the Cold War, the wall came down, they stopped doing training sorties. They had training weeks, and that was the week that everybody went on leave because they didn't want to fly nights. The Tornados were unprepared to fly nights. So they're going into a combat zone in a seed roll with their lights on. And we have harm shooting F-16s in front of us. We've got harm shooting F-16s behind us. And we've got this long string of airplanes that is probably 60 miles long um, because we all have spacing. Um, you know, we, we're spaced out by time. And we're going to do both left and right hooks. So we'll come in with a left hook. Five and six will come in in a right hook. And we're alternating hooks. And we're also hitting off base targets. So we want to we want to give the air defenders the biggest problem. So that's the first thing that goes wrong. The second thing that goes wrong is AWACS is calling out bullseye references over Montenegro for air activity over Montenegro. Montenegro is behind us. We're, we're entering from, Al from Albania. And coming up from the south, because we weren't allowed to overfly Croatia in the early days. So we had to take this long leg around in the south, go in over Albania, and then come in, come in uh, through Kosovo and avoid Montenegro and Croatia. Now, we might have accidentally clipped the quarter on Montenegro. I, I can't remember. Um, I do remember that there was Janika Airfield was really good for updating your radar because we don't have GPS either. So you update your INS by imaging uh, the airfield. So we're sailing in. AWACS is calling out the... German Tornado guys get confused and they think the air contact is right on top of them. And so they get, you can hear them on the radio, they're getting nervous and nervous. And the next thing I know, two Tornado ECRs are outbound in blower, the other way yelling, cover cannon, cover cannon. And I never saw them again. <laughs> so before we get to the target area, the Luftwaffe has gotten confused and they've bolted. And since they bolted an afterburner, even if they get their situational awareness back, they probably don't have the fuel to get back into the fight. So seed guys gone. Okay, but we got prowlers, we got harm shooters. I'm I'm feeling good, and we're in a three position, and we're in a long. Uh, we're kind of strung out because the way we flew n nav flare trail is it your night formation was just slightly offset and two to four miles between you, so you could keep the jet in front of you in front in, in the lantern in the infrared projection on the HUD. So that was the way we flew the formation. Didn't have NDGs, didn't have data link. So that's the way you've got to fly it. And we're coming in, the, the GBU-24 is a glide weapon. Okay, so it is it is shaped. It is It has a, a nice little profile. And I had planned it for a medium steep angle because I'm going into a bunker. And we'll show you the film of the bunker later. And the... It's underground, but I expect it to reveal itself because they planted a hedge around it. So they've got this hedge on three sides of the bunker. So I'm going to see the hedge on radar at, at where, where it's grass. I mean, it's under the grass, but I'm going to see this three-sided U-shaped hedge in a specific location. I want to see it at 38 miles when I try to radar map it. And sure it is. So that's why you know, when you see the tape, you'll hear Dave Dodger goes, oh, there it is. Map it, brother. <laughs> because even the pilot can find this target on the radar. So we're sailing in and it's a long range weapon. We're going to do a, a lasing profile that is pretty continuous. Sorry. Minute. Yeah. Plus I'm on the call. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the call, sir. Cause you're knocking really loudly. Sorry. Let me do this. Wave your hands again. So that, okay, yeah, good. Okay. So long continuous lay profile and before we release one or two calls back and said, yeah, we missed the weapons aren't guiding. And it's like, okay, I have no, there is nothing in my bag of tricks for this. The weapons are not guiding. It's like, okay, get closer. That's all I got. Hey, I got a Dave get closer. So we get closer in our plan release range. We release the weapon, both weapons guide, and I didn't realize till much later, one does not detonate. The lead weapon does not detonate. So what we're doing is called consecutive miracles. I'm dropping two GBU-24s, probably 100 millisecond separation, one after the other, 
And the first one is going to dig a channel for the second penetrator to go in through. And that's one of the ways you handle uh, concrete because the blue 109, which is our penetrator 2000 pounder, only goes through X number of feet of concrete. But you get almost 2X number of feet of concrete if you've got one after the other. First one does not detonate. It's just this giant slug at 1100 feet per second digging a channel. The second one goes in and shells out the whole thing. I don't realize this actually till years later looking at the tape. So we're good. Four delivers. We're off to the left. All the stuff is coming in behind. We are now outbound. We zoom up to 44,000 feet. We do not use afterburner because afterburner can be seen for 100 freaking miles. As you know, the video we just saw, you see these long blue flames coming out of the back? Yeah, so long blue flames are bad. And we're outbound and other strikes are going on. The F-16s come in and they go zero for four. All four of their weapons missed. Two of the weapons missed because the pilots flew above 25,000 feet in the lays in a designated turn and the um, the lasers shut off and they did not notice it. They didn't notice till the debrief. So, you know, that could happen in a Strike Eagle too. That's one of the things the Wizzo does for you. So the way we handle that is, you, you know, you would give you might give your pilot an altitude call, but if you were late, you would just bang forward on the stick that gets their attention in a heartbeat and they all know exactly what you mean and they don't go above twenty five thousand feet the other two weapons from the viper guys those missed and i i reviewed all their tapes and i could not see any mistakes that the air crew made that would have caused those weapons to miss and they they blamed the fire from my bunker hit you know that was their first excuse yeah there was a fire there and it messed with everything it's like bullshit let's see your tapes and sure enough i see their tapes and they yeah it's burning the bunker is burning um but that isn't going to affect their delivery. So I'm not quite sure why that happened. So we're outbound. We're smoking out. You know, we're light. We're feeling good. And Dodger says, what's that left seven o'clock? And I look over. And what he has seen, which we don't figure out till later, is an SA-3 self-destructing at some distance at altitude behind us at our seven o'clock. But I am looking over in the, to see the second missile self-destruct. And I thought somebody had just gotten splashed because that was not part of our training. I mean, I had done I had done a threat guide for specific for Strike Eagles, and it wasn't just 3-1. I'd incorporated stuff from the Defense Intelligence Agency. What does the smoke trail look like? What what color is the booster smoke? But the night appearance of a weapon self-destructing, that had never occurred to me. And so we're seeing it looks like somebody just got splashed off in the distance. But as I'm looking over the shoulder, number six hits. Now, number five has made a mistake and missed with his bombs. Easy mistake to make. Um, number six puts two penetrators in underground jet fuel storage. And so I'm looking over my left shoulder when this giant freaking volcano kicks off. And that's what I thought Dodger was initially referring to as I go, that's P.O.L. We were 20 something miles away. And I could have held taken the lineup card off my leg held it up and read it by the light of the fireball. Really? It was amazing. So that was Rich Piercy's pair of bombs. And he just went in and boom, full fuel storage and volcanoes up. And it's just bright. And now, of course, my night vision's shot. Um, And we're back out and everybody comes out. We check in. We're good. We didn't lose anybody. There were SA-3 shots. The, the Prowler guys counted 14. There were harms shot. Uh, there was jamming on target. And I remember on inbound, I remember a harm going in over my shoulder. And I thought to myself, well, that's comforting. You know, as much as I say, you know, sitting here at 1G and 0 knots, yeah, it's an F-16 fired harm. You know, it's not going to do as well as an F-4G fired harm. In the heat of the moment, it was like, harm, woohoo, go get him. So, you know, that's defense suppression, right? Because the guys on the other end are thinking the same thing, only opposites. They're going, damn it, harm. Um, so <laughs> it worked. We got in, we got out first night. And that works. Why? Why, why did you choose? Uh, sorry, if if you've already referenced it in terms of the the penetrator uh, blue one hundred nine, I think you said it was. Um, why, why GBU twenty four instead of um, GBU ten or? Well, why GBU twenty four instead of GBU ten? Um, in our case, for uh, I think it was just that they were cooler, and we had them on the inventory list. That's what. <laughs> that's how I really think it happened. From a standpoint, the only person that, that really needed GBU-24s was me because I was the only one attacking a horizontal target. And I didn't even use the the mode for a horizontal target. I wanted them to come at an angle, so I used mode two, which is, you know, uh, shape trajectory. But 
it's not a radical shaping of the trajectory. And so it worked and it was, it's, it was, I felt the most reliable mode. What we didn't know because we hadn't done enough live drops in training after again, the peace dividend is that there were two problems. One is the planning data we used was out of date, incomplete and somewhat incorrect. The manufacturer knew this and the air force knew this. They just hadn't gotten around to disseminating the data for the changes for our dash 34. The second thing was an ambiguity had crept into the, the checklist for the loading or not for the loading guys, but for the guys that built the bombs, it said incorrectly that one of the switches could either be in the a or the B position, except that if you put it in the a position, the bomb went stupid. And if you put it in the B position, it worked. There was no way to catch that error because we were not doing drops in training. We should have been doing inert drops at GB 24s, but we weren't. Hmm. So literally, um, when we in allied force one third of all the weapons i dropped failed to guide failed to explode or both and that was common we're looking at strike eagle wing and a block 40 wing pgms uh, are our bread and butter and because we didn't get to do gb24s in training there had been some errors crept in uh same thing happens to the b52 so the B-52 has what's called a HAVNAP, which is an Israeli-built 3,000-pound datalink guided weapon, like the um, like the AGM-130, only with much more, more more range and a bigger bang. They tried two shots, and they both failed. Hmm. And so they never used them again. They never tried to use them again. Why did they fail? Well, what we figured out later is during a software load, when an AGM-142 comes off the airplane, there is a two-second inhibit where the flight controls are not allowed to actuate because the gyro has not spun up. The gyro does not start to spin up till you release the weapon and then it's fully spun up in two seconds and then you can deflect the flight controls because if you deflect them while the gyro is spinning, the weapon will tumble. A programming error had moved to decimal point. So the inhibit was changed from two seconds to 0.2 seconds. And so the weapon came off the airplane, the autopilot deflected the flight controls, the gyro was not spun, the weapon spun into the Adriatic Ocean. Wow. So that kind of thing is something that bedeviled us for Allied Force. We also had insufficient training for live munitions because we didn't understand concrete dust. Didn't understand what happens when you drop a multi-story building, which I will also show on film exactly what happens when you drop a multi-story building. And... So GBU-24s, we stopped using them. We moved to 10s um, for a while, and I'm not convinced we ever moved back. I had much better reliability with the 10s, and it wasn't until much later that we figured out what the tech order problem was. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of people to blame. Um, not us, of course, because, you know, really good squadron and we're studs. So then we kind of get into the 72 hours, man. 72 hours of targets, and... Now what? So now they're scrambling for targets. And fortunately, this is kind of hidden because we get crappy weather days. Weather comes in, it's March, it's crappy. We don't take off. We aborted those missions because of the weather, but it was an easy call to say we're not flying this day because we had no targets. And then we go into CNN targets. So I took off on a target one day where I'm going to attack underground fuel storage with a bunch of Mark 82s. They're not going to penetrate the ground. They're not going to get to the fuel storage. And and there's no visual depictions. I've got nothing I can bounce a laser off. It's just in an empty field. There might not even have been underground fuel tanks there. I have to take a radar offset off a pond, you know, in order to get the proper target designation. And we actually flew that mission. I think I was number three, uh, or even better yet, number four. Um, and we dropped the bombs. They did nothing. I mean, this was the point we were at where it was important for us to take off with bombs and land without bombs. And the way we referred to it, uh, the aviators themselves, is we called it suspected. We were bombing suspected truck parks in the jungle, just like Vietnam along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So if you talk to an allied force vet and you say, yeah, I spent a week bombing suspected truck parks in the jungle. That's exactly what we're talking about. Mm. And then we started to get other targets. We started to hit communications facilities. Uh, you know, we started to hit bridges and it it got to be um, actually more useful all the way through April. And at the end of April, we ran out of things to hit. 
Um, and you know, I, I only got one virgin target in the entire, uh, month of May. Virgin target being one that hadn't been struck before. One that hadn't been struck before. And my weapon studded. Um, so we're flying and, and I, I'm flying knights in the first couple. And I don't like knights. I don't like knights because they're dark. And the advantage of a knight is that anytime somebody lights off a missile, you can see it. Uh, the disadvantage is you initially think that it's all going for you. So I'm doing some night missions and we're shuffling around. I don't actually have a fixed pilot for this. Uh, you know, it's I'm going where I needed. It, it. I was one of the mission commanders and now mission commander is an upgrade. You know, and it had suddenly become an upgrade in like the beginning of 1999. So I got a grade sheet that said mission commander. Boom. Good to go. Like probably after my first mission command sortie and allied force, we were just doing all the paperwork. Don't let me forget my combat check ride. And we're just hitting things. I'm moving from pilot to pilot. I get to fly with Shooter Wyatt. Okay. Shooter, who you've flown with. A great guy. One of the two best first lieutenants I ever flew with. The other being Fifi Malakowski. And uh, I just got stuck on. The, I'm now in a number two position. And this is awesome. And one of the targets we're going to go against that you'll see is we're going to go against train tunnels, you know, a train leading from uh, Kosovo into Pristina. And we managed to collapse a train tunnel. We bombed some uh, Serbian police positions. Um, we're just doing strike eagle interdiction things. And I finally get moved to days. Okay. So now that I'm in days, I do not have to eat six pound roast beef sandwiches, three meals a day. Not that I'm not cool with that. Um, I'm now taking full advantage of my four-star hotel and I'm actually eating high quality Italian food and cycling in the Alps. Cause you know, as I pointed out before, you're only flying, we're only flying once every three days because we, that was the a, a pace that you can keep up forever without chronic fatigue problems. So mission plan or soft one day, fly another day, day off. And on a day off, I'm cycling in the Alps, um, which is great. So I'm literally having, this is terrible to say I'm having the time of my life. Um, you know, we had another mission. I'm still on nights, and I guess his Easter rolled around. And we got to this is where you learn the important lesson. Just because they declare an Easter ceasefire doesn't mean they don't shoot at you. Which is fair because we were flying a strike mission, right? So, you know, I'm flying Easter morning, two o'clock in the morning. It's an ammunition factory at I think Kraljevo. And um ammunition factories at night. That's like three thumbs up and I only have two thumbs and I'm going to get busted if I whip out thumb number three. So we're, we're flying the mission. I'm flying with a guy up the front who, who is an older aviator who is um, at the wing, but had come back after a staff tour and had really not had the time or the sorties to spin up to the level where I'm sure he wanted to be. And so the aircraft on that night, um, we get separated. We blow the formation. I know where the guys are because I've got the radar. And the pilot is going down his hierarchy of things he can do to just keep the aircraft at an altitude, at an airspeed. And even navigation is kind of questionable. And I realize he's in the condition when I realize he's not answering the radio calls. No big deal. I start answering the radio calls and his essay is completely tumbled. He doesn't know where he is, but he trusts me enough to just listen to the dude in the back and he follows my instructions. So, you know, he's delivering the bare minimum, but he's delivering the bare minimum, not going to call off the drop. You know, we're split from the formation. We come in and uh, we drop a 2000 pounder on our first target. We're going to make two passes and the bomb goes stupid. And the reason the bomb goes stupid is because one of the things we didn't know is that when you're bouncing the laser off your target, the computer determines the range of the target, and that affects the rate at which the pod moves to keep that target under the crosshairs. Of course, you have to the pod has to turn its head because you're moving. When it gets a false range return because you are bouncing off of clouds, it thinks that you are much closer than you actually are and suddenly moves the pod at a rap at a higher rate of speed. We didn't know that because the training laser only fires one pulse per second. Oh. And so it 
doesn't do that to you. So the live laser, even if you're punching the laser through wispy clouds, which I thought we were doing, slewed my pods, my pot off and it eats bejesus. And I, I'm never able to guide that weapon. It also doesn't go off, so it doesn't matter. And if a 2,000 pound goes off in your immediate area, you know it. So I know that weapon dudded. So it's like, all right, we're separated from the fourth shift. There's a lot of confusion. Things are on fire. There's smoke. We're going to come around for the second pass, my second bunch of targets. And all I've got is I got six Mark 82s set to drop in a single string. Uh, and we come back around, and I, I talk guy up front through it. He sets us up on course. He's, I've got a designation. We follow the ASL and hit the pickle button. And the first bomb, I guess the last bomb in the string or the first bomb in the string, depending on how you count it, the one farthest aft in the string, shacks the target, which is a warehouse allegedly full of 155 millimeter artillery shells. Well, if it's not full of 155 millimeter artillery shells, it's full of something else that makes a big bang. So that sucker goes off and now I'm feeling totally vindicated. You know, I've at least hit one of my targets. Uh, we're good to go. I, I lay a string through a bunch of other buildings. and I later tracked the string. I did a presentation called what I did on my summer vacation. And I've got, you know, unclassified photos where I put an X where all my bombs lasted. Um, and now I we're out of there. You know, I know where the other four ship is. We're behind. We catch him. I talk him through. We go and land. So importance of the two seater um, was that uh, the front seater had had lost his situational awareness and could not get it back through the tools that were available um, through the radar, through the moving map, through all that. That's okay. Okay. I still had SA. I could throw my, the occasional situational biscuit to the front seat, bounce it off the helmet and we're good to go. So effective mission. Um, and it worked out. And I can't remember if that was my last night sortie, but we, we started shifting to, uh, to days um, and a variety of targets. And so, I think also on the list is the mission that I should have called off. Yeah. But before you before you do that though, um the thing I'm curious about is whether or not that's just something that happens in fighter squadrons, whether or not, you know, guys who are in wing jobs have to come along and fly and whether or not it's okay for them to come along and fly in combat or if that's something that shouldn't happen but does. Okay, so it could happen to anybody. It's less likely to happen if you've got more flying if you're you're more proficient, meaning you're getting more flying time. So guys now, I mean, I used to get 300 plus hours a year. Guys now at 120 hours a year, they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. um, so it shouldn't happen. You, you can say it shouldn't happen, but we're all fighter guys. I mean, we we got there because we've got some pretty good skill set. We can handle a bunch of things, but sometimes it's going to happen. And so I honestly, um, I'm not saying the guy's name because he's a dirtbag because he's not. Um, I'm not saying his name because I don't want to embarrass the poor bloke by by highlighting one sortie that I flew with him in which he wasn't at his best. Right. I sure I've flown sorties that I was not at my best. It's just fortunately, I don't remember any of those. <laughs> and <laughs> so it was fine. I mean, the, the, the debriefable item would not have been, hey, you lost situational awareness. The debriefable item was I had situational awareness. OK, and. You let me hand it back to you. And as far as I'm concerned, he did everything right. You know, he didn't have it. I was the first one to recognize he didn't have it because the radio calls. I picked up the radio calls. Um, that's the way a two-seat aircraft should work. And I was able to hold the situational for aircraft awareness for the aircraft, carry us through the weapons drops, set him back up for success as we're going towards a post-strike tanker, and we're good to go. That that falls under the category of things that just happen. And I think it's a huge advantage of the two seater because you can see the opposite. You can see the the shoot down uh, when an F-16 bagged a bunch of Galebs in deny flight in the no fly zone. The wingman there is Scott O'Grady. Yeah. And if you listen to that tape, which you'll probably never get to listen to, but it's heinous. O'Grady's lost. Can't find his lead is asking for a snap. His lead basically says three or two go home. Fox three. He's in the middle of a missile shot and he tells his wingman to get lost because he hasn't got the tools to to handle that. Had O'Grady been in a two-seater with a Wizzo that had situational awareness, he A, might not have lost it, B, might have been able to get it back, and C, probably wouldn't have been told to go home. Uh, and so those are, that's just stuff that happens. Hmm. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.